Austin. And um, this time it gets recorded in this way. So I'm delighted by that. Uh, just to pause before I begin to honor my friend, Rabbi a Andy Sachs, a graduate of Penn, who then made Aliyah after becoming a rabbi at JTS. And throughout his career, my dear friend Andy passed yesterday in Jerusalem. He was the person responsible for conversions in Israel for the conservative movement and for inclusion of gays within the larger community as well a wonderful, wonderful rabbi and teacher. And as his funeral is today, my hand is on my heart. And I am honored to have this time to elevate his soul through the talking of Torah with you, Susanna, as we honor a colleague. So much of your scholarship has focused on interfaith understanding and that'll be somewhat of our trajectory today, leading us to talk about college campuses and the tensions there, the rise of anti-Semitism more widely. But as a place to begin, your scholarship, and I mentioned to you, I, I started my day rereading parts of the Aryan Jews, which Jesus. is Aryan the Aryan Jesus. Jews. Jesus. And what I found remarkable in your scholarship is this is one of your many books that and articles that deal with anti-Semitism and the way that religion can be co-opted as part of that story. Your career, your writing has largely focused on this theme of interfaith understandings and anti-Semitism. So to start from the beginning, how would you understand how and why you were drawn to this focus of scholarship? Well, that's an interesting question. And I would say anyone who becomes a scholar of Jewish experience in any field, Jew, as a musicologist, as a historian, as a philosopher, anti-Semitism always comes up always in every field. It's something we have to confront and think about and understand in terms of the context of the material we're studying. So for instance, there's an Israeli professor of music, musicology, Ruth Hakoin, who published a wonderful book called The Music Libel Against the Jews, in which she demonstrates, it's a big thick book, she demonstrates that historically in Europe, Christians have understood themselves as producing harmony, beautiful music, whereas Jews were understood as producing just noise. So that's the libel against the Jews. Now we know of course that there were Jewish composers who produced beautiful music, but she helps us understand how that beautiful music composed by Jews was not well received to say the least and not incorporated yeah, into the Western tradition. So the same is true of whatever we study. All of us have to think about the anti-Semitism that surrounded whatever era or piece of material we're investigating as scholars of Judaism. Can you talk, again, I'm still focused on your own trajectory for the important focus of your work and I can't help but start early in your life with your dad's involvement, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, his involvement with Vatican II. To what degree did, can you talk a little bit about Vatican II and its hopes for changing that quality of discourse? Yes, well, you know, it is in fact something rather unexpected that my father would have been involved in the Second Vatican Council as a person who represented the Jewish world as the Catholic Church formulated its very new and important statement about how it should understand Judaism and the continued validity of our covenant with God. My father was born into a Hasidic family in Warsaw in 1907. He was tutored by Special teachers were brought in. He was very brilliant, so he had special tutors. 
he he grew up in a Hasidic environment. My father had no contact with Christians of any meaningful sense. But when he was a teenager, he wanted to study the West, philosophy, science, history. And he went to the University of Berlin in 1927, which at the time he felt was the intellectual and cultural capital of the universe. It was thrilling to be there. And he took courses in art history and philosophy and so on. And he always felt that <laughs> his professors, brilliant though they were, had much to learn from Judaism um, that could help them, actually. So um, as you know, uh, my father was rescued at the last minute and brought to the United States in March of 1940. Uh, he taught at Hebrew Union College for five years and then moved to the Jewish Theological Seminary. But he lived through a terrible time. He used to talk about librarians at a Jesuit library. And he asked them, why don't you say something about what the Nazis are doing? This is in Berlin. And they said, well, then the Nazis might close our library. He did have a good relationship with some Quakers in Frankfurt who helped him and helped other Jews. But he didn't have a very good feeling about the Christian world. My father was in Nazi Germany at a time when Christian theologians said that the Old Testament was a Jewish book and should be removed from the Christian Bible. And these were theologians who said Jesus was not a Jew. Jesus was an Aryan, basically a German. So there would be every reason to expect that my father would not want to have anything to do with Christians at that point. When he came to the United States, he, for what? Look what they did. My father's mother and three of his sisters were murdered. Why would he want to associate with Christians? And yet my father felt that it was his duty, his responsibility. He was given a life taken out of Nazi Europe at the last minute. What would he do then? He wanted to make the world better. And so what is different about my father's approach because there were other Jews engaged in Christian Jewish dialogue. What's different is my father did not talk about Christian antisemitism. Doesn't do that. He also doesn't talk about Jesus. There are a lot of Jews who were talking about Jesus. Jesus was Jewish. Jesus was a good Jew. My father didn't do that. My father said, you know, he wanted Christians to have a sense of the holiness of Judaism. How could he convey that? And so we used to have guests when I was a child, guests at our Shabbat dinner table. And sometimes my father would invite Christian priests, even nuns would come to our home dressed in habits, black and white habits, a priest with a collar. And this was very unusual in those days. Christians didn't go to Jewish homes and not to the home of a rabbi and not on Shabbat. And they would come in, and I can remember quite vividly that they were very moved. They came into a Jewish home Friday night. The candles were lit. They came to our table. My father made Kiddush. And they felt it. They felt the holiness of Shabbat. And I think for them, it was an extraordinary experience. Could they really say after that that Jews are going to go to hell? No. On the contrary, they thought, I think they thought to themselves, you know, we have something to learn about God from a Jew. And that was extraordinary. So that was my father's approach. Well, that's my hand goes again to my heart in terms of feeling present at your Shabbat table and the beauty that those Christian leaders must have experienced. In terms of Vatican II, talk a little bit about the politics of Vatican II and how that has created a different trajectory of Christian-Jewish dialogue. Well, what was important to my father, first of all, was that Christians should stop trying to convert Jews. No more missionary effort. He said that that was a form of, of spiritual murder, 
to take away a Jew from Judaism is destroying your identity. So he wanted that removed. And he wanted the continued validity of Judaism recognized. And he wanted efforts made for Christians to appreciate Judaism, not just tolerate Judaism, but appreciate. And in many ways that we, we're different, he, he said, on points of what we believe, but there's another level, which is that all religious people, whatever your religion, we all have moments of despair. We all have moments when, as you said, your close friend, Rabbi Andy Sachs, just passed away. That pain of losing someone you love, we all have that. We all have moments when it's hard to believe or it's hard to pray. My father said, that's where we should help each other, Christians and Jews. How do we cope with our pain? How can we have some kind of sustenance? And there he said, you know, we can help each other with, for example, our appreciation of the Psalms, with the feelings of support we can give to each other, with some insight of what do you do in a moment of despair or frustration, or simply you just don't feel inspired one day in the synagogue. Something's blocking the feeling that you need to pray, a feeling of vulnerability. We push it away. So my father said, we as Christians and Jews can work together on that level. He called that depth theology. And his efforts, I know, in meeting with Pope John XXIII, um, led to the Vatican Council initiating Christian-Jewish dialogue on a communal level that truly was unprecedented before and has continued. Meanwhile, your own scholarship led into, if you will, the thicket of anti-Semitism in Christian-Jewish relations. What was the first paper that, or book that you wrote on that topic? Well, actually, the first the first book I did was about a Jewish historian in the 19th century, fascinating figure named Abraham Geiger. Right. In Germany, and he was born Orthodox. Uh, he went to university. He had an anti-Semitic experience at the University of Heidelberg, and he left. And he went instead to the University of Bonn. And there he met some Jewish students, young men like himself. Women were not allowed to go to university yet. And they had a professor, professor who was warm and welcoming and was happy to work with Jewish students uh, and actually welcomed them in a wonderful way. These students studied Arabic with this professor and started reading the Quran. One of these students translated the Quran into German, which is a very big, difficult task. Abraham Geiger wrote a book in which he described all the parallels between the Quran and rabbinic literature, Mishnah, Midrash, a book that was published in 1833 and was hailed all over Europe to this day as having launched the field of Islamic studies. Mm. And then he went on later in his career, he could not become a professor at a German university in those days, but he was a rabbi and he continued his scholarship and he wrote about Christianity. He actually wrote a big, important, difficult book about Judaism during the second temple period. So prior to the year 70 CE. And then based on that book about the nature of Judaism, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the temple and so on, he then was able to situate aspects of the New Testament within the context of Judaism. And he showed the parallels between some of the teachings of Jesus and those of the rabbis. And he said that Jesus himself was a Pharisee. And 
that book or the, the, and those subsequent many articles that he published on this, these were widely read. And that was what was interesting to me, that Geiger's work was read by Christian theologians. They discussed it, they reviewed it, they disputed it, they argued with it, but they engaged. He was at the forefront. And often they wrote very negative things to say that Jesus is a Pharisee, one person wrote, is to my mind 10 times more horrific than the crucifixion. Which is, you know, you start to think, why? What's going through his mind? What's so horrific about it? But okay. Um, so that was for me a kind of um, initiation into this whole field of Jewish Christian relations and how it began to take shape by historians making very clear statements that today we take for granted. But 150 years ago, it was startling. This is, by the way, uh, 125th anniversary of Geiger's death. Mm. Um, and, and so that that began my interest. Now, I just want to say something. During this time as a student, while I was beginning to think about this book, I was going to Germany to learn German, that perfect my German and study. It was hard for me to be there for many reasons, you can understand. And um, while I was there, I met I met Christians. Some of them had devoted themselves to studying the horrors of the Nazis. And they had devoted themselves also to studying what was wrong with Christian theology, that it was so negative and, and nasty about Judaism. And those people accompanied me and still do accompany my heart, my soul, my mind. I felt that they understood something, that they had gone into the horror place in a way that my friends in America couldn't understand. And then of course I met plenty of German Christians who were indifferent uh, and who also said horrible things. It's another problem. Uh, there was an article that appeared in a magazine that I was anti-Semitic, and I called the editor on the phone when I was in Germany. And I told him, this is anti-Semitic. He said, how do you know? I said, well, look, I've just taught a seminar on anti-Semitism at the University of Frankfurt, and I'm a professor. And I thought that would carry some, some weight. You're a professor in Germany is, you know, a thing, it's something. This is, when was, was this article? How recently? Oh, this was in 1991. Okay. And it was basically somebody, no, 93. Um, somebody named Krista Mulak argued that the Nazis obeyed the commands of Hitler just like the Jews obey the commandments of God. Now that's anti-Semitism. It's clear, it's anti-Semitism. And the editor said, no, I don't think it is. And I said, look, I'm telling you it is, I'm a professor. And he said, yeah, you're a Jew and you're biased. Ooh. Now that experience for me was very powerful. What it made me feel was that I was backed into a corner and I couldn't get out. It was like, you know, a rat in a maze and can't find the way out. There was just, what do you do with that? I had no authority. I had no, yeah, I mean, he, yeah, I was erased. Yeah. And I think that emotional experience that I had, and it was terrible for me. And I had experiences like that over and over again. That feeling of, of it being trapped. I thought, you know, this is what Abraham Geiger experienced. This is what Jews experienced in the past, this feeling of being trapped. And that's why we talked earlier, I'm giving a lecture tonight about anti-Semitism at Dartmouth. Not anti-Semitism at Dartmouth, I'm giving a lecture and it's taking place at Dartmouth, just to clarify. But one of the things that I've been writing about lately is that scholars of anti-Semitism think so much about the economic and political motivations and all of that that's very important but in addition to that, there's also the trauma the Jews experience. It's also the emotional experience of anti-Semitism that also needs to be taken into consideration. So it's 30 years since that conversation in Germany, and much of your scholarship has focused on anti-Semitism. What is it that you would want and try to convey to your students now about the nature of anti-Semitism, which you just began to talk about, but focus on that. What have you learned in these 30 years that surprises you 
and that is often not understood as the nature of anti-Semitism? Well, I published an article in, a, in an Israeli journal called Sion. It appeared in Hebrew, but it's now there's an English version. And where I argued that anti-Semitism has to be understood as sadism. That is, it's not just about aggression. There's a sadistic quality that has to be taken into consideration. And by that, I mean that there is a pleasure that anti-Semites experience by being anti-Semitic. And it's a pleasure that is never satisfied, but has to be repeated. The anti-Semitic anti act, whether it's verbal or if it's physical violence, has to be constantly repeated over and over because the sadist is never satisfied. And the sadistic quality of it also means that there is an emotional element that we have to try to understand. What is the emotional gratification that anti-Semites experience. And that's also partly um, the result of work that I've read about anti-Black racism and about enslavement of Africans in America, where scholars talk a lot about the trauma that is experienced by the Black person, by the slave, the enslaved person, and that's witnessed by the enslaver, the white enslaver. And the white enslaver, in other words, can whip someone and see how traumatic it is and take pleasure from that trauma. That's the sadistic quality. To take pleasure when you've inflicted pain on another person, when you've traumatized another person. And I think we need to think about those elements when we talk about antisemitism. The trauma that's inflicted and the pleasure that is some people experience from inflicting that trauma. That's part of the story. And that's part of the story that I haven't seen as, as a focus and is something I look to learn more from you and your writing and speaking about. So I'm gonna pivot now because that of course evoked in me lots of um, emotion and you know, trauma is a bit paralyzing. College campuses, you are a professor at Dartmouth what distinctions would you make about protests on college campuses and anti-Semitism? And what is the place of anti-Semitism that you're witnessing in America today? Well, I think we're living in a terrible, terrible time. Um, and I, we know that already. This is a very terrible time in Jewish history. And this date of October 7th, 2023, will go down in, in infamy. And we're still trying to come to grips with it. The entire country of Israel is terribly traumatized, but every Jew around the world is affected by this. And, and I look at what's going on today in France with the elections. What, what do you do as a Jew in France? Whom do you vote for? Do you vote for this traditional, uh, traditionally anti-Semitic political party of Le Pen? I, because it wants to ban Muslims, because it's, I mean, I, or do you vote for the liberals? And keep in mind what how Jews responded to the Dreyfus affair in the 1890s by saying we have to speak up for liberalism, for republicanism. That didn't do us any good. At any rate, politically, we're in a terrible situation. In terms of the college campuses, on that day, I felt something had had been killed, something had ended. I went to the synagogue that morning, October 7th, and I looked at everybody and I thought, you don't know yet. You don't know yet what's just happened, but this is over. Simchat Torah. Yes, and Shabbat, it, it's over. And it is over. We will never be the same as Jews. That's it. And... Uh, yeah. Say say another word. Say, what, what did you feel was over? Say a word about that. A sense of security, a sense it can happen here, to use Sinclair Lewis's title, um, a, a sense that Israel was going to take care of Jews and Zionism was the promise that we were safe. And no, we are not safe. Uh, that, the, that the Zionism we were promised is deteriorated in the state of Israel into a terrible political situation 
where the the prime minister is not taking care of us. Yeah. That's not Zionism. That's not a Jewish state where the prime minister only visits the families of people who support him politically. I mean, I'm talking about the families of the hostages. And he doesn't visit the parents of hostages if those parents don't support him. What, what kind of a person is this? Zionism is Jews for everybody, all Jews together. All Jews care about all Jews, period. That's the whole point. And safety. We have to be safe. That's why we want a state. That's what we say. Had there been a Jewish state, my grandmother would have had a place to go. So, so already on October 7th, when you went to synagogue that Shabbat morning, you had a sense that a new a line had been drawn in a new phase. And how would you characterize how that's unfolded for you and, and what you see around you? Well, let me just say what we did at Dartmouth. So yeah. my first thought was, let's gather. I'm, I'm sitting here right now in the seminar room, Jewish studies, and I would invite my faculty colleagues who are in this building in several departments, classics, Middle Eastern studies, Russian, comparative literature, and so on. And we'll get together and we'll talk about what happened and see if we can support one another. And then I got a call from my colleague who is chair of the Middle Eastern Studies program, Tarek el Aris, who's originally from Lebanon, who grew up during the Beirut Civil War, um, who said, I told him he was at the time in Cairo about to lead an alumni trip and his voice sounded terrible. He sounded the way I sounded, devastated. And I told him I'm gonna bring the faculty, have a few faculty, he said, open it up, let everybody come. Why limit it just to Reed Hall? So I emailed our administrator, a wonderful woman, Jennifer Thomas, who's Jewish, was married to an Israeli, who was devastated. And because this is Dartmouth, she answers her email on the weekend. We you know we work 24 seven at Dartmouth, everybody. Everybody's in this together all the time. So I told her, let's do something. Can you get us a room Tuesday, Thursday afternoon at 4.30, which is the standard time for a big event. And she did over the weekend. And then Monday morning, I got a call from the Dean of Faculty who had just met with the president of Dartmouth. And the president had said, call Susanna, see about organizing faculty as a dialogue. Well, I told her we already set it up. So what we did on Tuesday and Thursday, we had four faculty, my, my colleague was still in Cairo, couldn't get back in time, but there were four of us from Jewish studies and Middle Eastern studies. Because the president had been involved, we had, everything was set up for us, the room, the, the overflow room, a live stream, everything. And we talked, we talked, the room was 90% students and some faculty and 600 on the live stream. And we talked about what happened and we were all pretty sick, devastated, sick at heart, horrified. And we did it again on Thursday. And, you know, I, I, was, in, I was in bad shape. I was very upset, but we set a tone for the campus. We, first of all, demonstrated that we're Jewish studies, Middle Eastern studies. We are friends with each other. We teach with each other. We talk to each other. And we spoke in personal terms. We spoke also about you know, the work we do, but we talked in a, in a tone of voice of respect and dignity. Uh, what is appropriate for an academic conversation as opposed to a conversation in someone's home or at a restaurant? And the students asked questions and some of the questions were painful to me, but they asked in a respectful way. And we said to them, we warned them, for example, don't pay attention to the TikTok and all of those things. Make sure you're getting accurate news and don't spread rumors. Make sure you understand that people are hurting emotionally. This is not a time to have an argument and a debate, let people recover. One student got up and said, is Israel an apartheid country? And my colleague responded by saying, first of all, why are you asking that question right now? 
What are you trying to do? And what do you want? Are you do you are you asking a question or are you making a statement? Um, that's very important to ask. What is what is your purpose here? And uh, and we emphasize to the students that this is not a, a story of the good guys and the bad guys. Don't look for that kind of narrative. And it can't be simplified because of the complexity of the situation. Now, I know that that dialogue that you helped initiate so close to October 7th became reported on nationally in a model of aspiration for others. That was before Israel went into Gaza. How did it unfold? It, you know, by the end of the school year, was there an encampment at Dartmouth? We had uh, on, on May 1st, well, first of all, let me just say, uh, just to come back, we had these events. And by the way, the second event was viewed by a thousand people on the live stream. Uh, and and it's still available on the YouTube. Um, but we also had this event because we have worked together for years, Jewish studies and Middle Eastern studies. We cross list courses, we co-teach courses, courses on Israel, Palestine are co-taught. Having two professors in the classroom is extremely important for many reasons. I was teaching in the fall a course on the 1967 war with a colleague from Middle Eastern studies. Just, I, you, we couldn't have done it. I mean, it would have been, it's not good to do it with one person. So because of that, we built on the relationship. We had it, it was pre-existing. You can't just jump in on October 7th after you've been in a state of animosity. So that's one thing. And then we immediately organized other dialogues. All year, we had programming on campus. We had speakers, we had discussions. We immediately put in the, the we were on a quarter system. So immediately added courses, extra courses on Israel that we hadn't been planning to teach, but we put them in. And we and, and it's going on right now and next year and so on. Extra courses, and the courses are uh, have high enrollment. Full, they're full. Um. So that's then we also got together after the fall term ended. The four of us went on a retreat. We went for three days to a little lodge in in Maine, <laughs> in the middle of nowhere, and we sat from nine a.m. to eleven p.m. And we talked about how to teach, what to teach, programming for the coming years, et cetera. We did this on our own time. This was our vacation time because we're devoted to this and we're going to do it again. We have a full week, September 2nd to 9th, where we're going to be doing the same thing. We're concerned about the textbooks that are used in the field. We want to set an example for others. Now, I just say one, one more thing. As I mentioned to you earlier, every day I get an email from the ADL telling me about incidents of anti-Semitism at various college campuses and the other organizations, combat anti-Semitism, all of these groups, they send the email, fine, but they never tell us what to do about it. And as I told you, I'm very frustrated by that. We're working hard I'm, I, here at Dartmouth and colleagues in Jewish studies at other universities, it's hard. We don't always know what to do. I want to know what other people are doing, what has worked well at other college campuses. Hillel doesn't advise us. Chabad doesn't advise us. I would like to see some advice. All we do is label the anti-Semitism, but what do I do to overcome it, to address it? And there are things that need to be done. And I can suggest some things, but I would like to hear from other people from educators, from psychologists, from political scientists, et cetera. And I don't understand, I feel betrayed and abandoned by the Jewish organizational world that they aren't giving us help, that they're just saying it's terrible. <laughs> so what are those few things that you would add, that you've learned, that you would want others to know? Yes, I would say, first of all, the co-teaching of classes. Uh, we brought in speakers, we bring in dialogue partners to demonstrate to students what can be done. We emphasize future, not as my colleagues, we don't want to litigate the past. We want to say, where are we going? We tell students, where, where do you want Israel to be 
Israel, Palestine, Egypt, Syria. So what do you want to see in 20, 30 years? What are the roadblocks to getting there? How can you address those roadblocks? Bring in specialists who work on different aspects of this conflict, which is a conflict that engulfs the world at this point. Everybody, see it in big terms. Don't just tell me about Israel. Tell me also about Egypt and Jordan and Syria and Russia's involvement in Syria and what's going on in Yemen. There are people with expertise in those areas, but when we just focus it on Israel, that we make Israel seem to be at blame, at fault for everything. And it's not. Israel is one small piece and a much bigger puzzle. And that needs to be emphasized. So those are some of the things. I want I, I cross list whenever possible courses with other departments, other disciplines. So we involve them as well. We want to engage on campus. I want to have allies on campus. I want people to talk to me. I think having the relationship also inhibits people from saying horrible things about Jews. They have Jewish friends. So our time has gone already quite quickly. It's almost 45 minutes already. And you, again, I just want to pause to recognize your and your colleagues' achievement at Dartmouth more than any campus in the country. And that's how it's been showcased. You had already in place a culture of dialogue and your students were able to feel and be guided to be engaged with respect for differences. The last piece, and this is already, you know, I also felt your frustration in terms of, as an educator, a lack of other disciplines guiding you and how to deal with the crisis of the moment. So my last question before I turn it over to Ari so that the people who've been listening to you can ask some more questions, and I'll reserve a, a last question, Ari. And that is, on the topic of anti-Semitism, which so much of your scholarship has focused on in one way or another. How scared are you in this moment for American Jewish life? And what do you, this is a harder one and a stretch, what do you hear in your minds as your father's words to you in assuaging your fears? Well, I will tell you that before Thursday night, I was feeling pretty good. President Biden flew to Israel immediately after October 7th. President Biden said, I am a Zionist, the first American president to say that. And I don't know about you, but boy, that meant a lot to me to hear an American president say, I am a Zionist. Wow. As a historian, that's huge, huge. I got scared Thursday night. I don't know what's so I'm off now. I'm I, I'm I'm <laughs> I'm scared. Yeah. My father said to me over and over, never despair. De despair is forbidden. Because despair is a way of saying, I don't believe that God is present. And God is present. And my father wrote that evil is never the climax of history. And so uh, I think also despair is a way of giving up. And I think we have to work hard. I've worked harder this year than ever in my, in my life. I'm getting calls I mean, I, I've been on Zoom meetings with deans and high school principals, and I've lectured at so many colleges that I can't even count how many. They all want advice. They don't know what to do. And that includes graduate programs, big universities. Uh, and uh, I, I, I'm not sure what to advise them. I do my best, <clears throat> but I think we need to come together. And that's what's fundamental about scholarship. No one is a scholar all alone. Everybody reaches and enhances their scholarly insight through discussion with others. And if we're isolated at the university, 
by our colleagues who aren't interested in Jewish studies or don't want to talk to us. It's a disaster for us. If we're isolated as Jewish studies professors from the rest of the Jewish world that thinks universities are just hotbeds of anti-Semitism and doesn't want to help and support us, that's a disaster. So we have to avoid those disasters and we have to work together and we have to work as hard as we can. I don't believe that this is a situation that is impossible to overcome, but I do think it's a big challenge. Very big challenge. Thank you, Suzanne. I'm gonna turn it now to Aris who will facilitate the people that have been part of our audience and, uh, and look to come back to say a closing word. Go ahead, Ari. Um, thank you for the conversation and uh, we're into our Q&A part. So feel free to chat everybody. People have been chatting. So there are a few questions. I'll start with a, kind of an early one, which is um, many of us, I know I do, I have children who've sat at my table when I've had guests and they tend to sit and leave and don't participate. So you... You started about, we heard about stories about your father having guests on the table and that I, I assume you were there. So what are your memories about that experience? And as a, as a child or a, um, I don't know how old you were, um, what did you get out? Did you participate? Did you sit at the table? Did you, what did you learn from those experiences? What are your memories from those experiences? Well, of course I was at the table, the Shabbat table. And uh <laughs> And I, you know, sometimes the guests were interesting and talked to me and paid attention to me. And that was great. And sometimes I just sat there quietly and watched. I really do remember vividly watching these nuns and priests and having a sense of how they were feeling when I look back. And, and uh, sometimes they were a lot of fun. I mean, I can tell you stories and, and, some of the jokes that were told and the humor. Uh, and yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't want to take too much time with, see, I know you have other questions. Well, it's a, it's a question because it's not that you weren't, we didn't think you were at the table. It's that like many of us have children, but the children leave the table, right? And my question to you was, were you a child who stayed at that table and were engaged in that and how that affected you personally, your, your career and your well, I, yes, I was at the table if I ever got up to, I mean, I, I liked going to the kitchen and helping my mother serve and and I liked the dishes. I, I loved when she let me pour tea at the end of the meal into the tea, beautiful china teacups and, and cut the cake for dessert and pass it around. I mean, that was thrilling for me. It was, um, what was it called? Susie Homemaker? games for children when I was a child. So this was sort of like being a grown-up version of it. And and of course, Burkata Mazon, I led when I was growing up. I led Burkata Mazon at the table. So yes, I was, I was around. Yeah. I'll shift to say that um, CSP goes on travel adventures. Obviously, COVID um, uh, stopped us for a while, but we just got back from Israel. Um, um, about a year ago, we went to explore Jewish Sfarad, and we're come, Rabbi Spitz is joining us for an adventure to Germany um, in November. And there are a lot of people that say they will never go there. They'll never go on a trip of learning like this. And I just wanted to get your thoughts on why people should go, whether it's CSP or another trip to Germany right now, um, because, you know, what they can learn from a trip like that. Well, um. So I've been going to Germany. I, first time I went, I thought I'll never go back. I went because I had to do an intensive German language program to get my PhD. Uh, and then I started going back as I was invited to give lectures and I had to do research. And I did research in Nazi archives in the 90s that I found very upsetting. Um, so, but that experience is more in the academic world um, I think Berlin is fascinating for many reasons. I've also seen Germany change. And now, for example, I'm going in early October to give a lecture on anti-Semitism in Lower Saxony for the person, there's a, a, a government person in charge of monitoring anti-Semitism in every German state. And so this is a lecture for that purpose. Um, I, Germany is a place where you you... I'm not allowed to say certain things. They have a category called Hetz propaganda that is 
words that can incite violence, simply forbidden. You cannot tell an anti-Semitic joke in a restaurant. You get arrested, they call the police. You, some people stood in front of a synagogue and said horrible things about Jews. The police came and put them in jail, that's it. You're convicted. You can't do that. In Germany, you, they, they would not allow certain people to enter Germany who had been invited to teach or lecture academics because of horrible things they'd said about Israel. They just are not allowed in. And you know, people say, oh, free speech. I'm grateful that there is a country in this world that says, no, you can't say that in our country. You can say those things anywhere else in the world, but in our country, this is not allowed. And I feel protected. And, and I think that's something that Germany has initiated and put into law because of the Holocaust. And I'm glad that they did that. I think that's highly appropriate. There was a question about campus anti-Semitism and your studies of anti-Semitism. And, and I guess the assumption is you studied more uh, right-wing anti-Semitism, historic anti-Semitism, and, and yet what we're seeing on campus, what we read about, for those of us who don't live on campus or go to campus, is a different, is a, a more left-wing anti-Semitism. From your perspective, can you explain the difference and what's going on? And how, if there, it, do, and you talked about people get pleasure out of anti-Semitism. Are, the, are these people on the left also getting that same pleasure, or is this something different that we need to understand? Those differences, uh, I don't see those differences, right wing, left wing, which all, by the way, stems from the French Revolution when they convened the National Assembly. You know, you sit on the right and you can sit on the left. That's how we get left wing, right wing. All right. I, I, at this point, they're the, pretty much, um, for the most part, the same, saying the same kinds of things to a great extent. And it doesn't really represent right position, but this is not the political position so much that comes through. But the, first of all, the quality of rage, the way that Jews are said to be all powerful uh, and in a sneaky way. Now, the way, the, one of the distinctions between anti-Black racism and anti-Semitism, anti-Black racism says Black people are inferior and they'll drag us down. Whereas Jews are said to be superior and they're gonna drag us down. Um, the, the issue is embedded in Christianity and some of the so-called political anti-Semitism is really very Christian. Uh, whether it's the work of Ashila Mbembe, who's considered an African philosopher, but who went to Catholic schools and is really writing theology, which is something I see because I've studied Christian theology and my colleagues don't necessarily see because they don't recognize it. Um, in, in the campus, the, the attitude is the worst, most awful thing is colonialism. And I think there are worse things, but okay. The British withdrew from India, the French withdrew from Africa, the Italians withdrew from Ethiopia, et cetera, et cetera. And all that's left is Israel, the colonial state. The, yeah? So Israel is defined as a colonial state, the only one that's still standing, and therefore it's a terrible state. Uh, and, we sh and it's associated with South Africa. And so divestment seems to be the answer. Now, of course, all of this is terrible, wrong and stupid on so many levels, where does one begin? Um, the, the whole model of colonialism is uh, was a somewhat useful way of thinking politically, but there's a lot more that goes on than simply colonialism. And colonialism isn't just about uh, owning a country or ruling a country, but it's also, of course, the how one exerts political and economic power. Um, and beyond that, the fact that Israel was not created through the Balfour Declaration, which is what everybody goes back to, Balfour, the English, there's the colonialism, it was created by a vote of the United Nations, all the countries, that's it, democratic process. To question it, which is what is so shocking now, you know, after October 7th, occupation was not about post-1967, it was about 1948 that Israel as a state was occupying Palestinian land. That was the argument after October 7th. Um, but that's undermining the international political order to challenge that United Nations vote. Uh, so it's, you know, it's on so many, it's, it's stupid, it's wrong, it's dangerous politically, et cetera, and it's anti-Semitic. So Israel becomes the, 
the terrible threat to the world. I mean, I also point out to people, you want to talk about divesting from Israel? What would you do if Israel decided to divest from you? You are so dependent on what Israel produces. So you'd have to give up the Waze app in your phone. You'd give up a lot of the technology in your computer. You'd give up your generic medicine that's made by Teva. You'd give up a driverless car because that was invented by Amnon Shashua, et cetera, et cetera. You want to divest, what are you going to divest from? Google and Intel? I mean, it, it's an absurdity. And the university's endowment is not a political tool to be fooled around with like that. That's not the instrument of making politics. Obviously, this is a, a good su subject for like multiple presentations. So I don't want to like continue because I know we have very limited time, but I appreciate your input. I guess one last question from me, and then we'll turn it back to Rabbi Spitz, which is um, people are wondering, and maybe this is just for your perspective, is what we're seeing on these campus, on these campuses, an, ampli an amplification of an issue. In other words, are most students either not interested in the issue or not involved in the campus protests? And what we're seeing is the news amplifying just a few students, or do you feel it's a bigger issue that is correctly being reported um, in the news? No, I think it's a small number of students who are getting very excited. And look, one has to understand the students are young. 18, 19, they go to college and they do everything to excess. They drink, they stay up all night, they take drugs, they smoke marijuana. They have a lot of sexual relationships that they you know, that are inappropriate, et cetera, et cetera, everything to excess. Then they graduate, they get a job, they get married, they calm down. So it's a period of time. Um, and that's why I also want advice from people who understand the mind of a 19 year old. It's not yet an adult brain. So my concern is more with faculty. So there may be a young, young group of students in there. And many, let me also say, some of those students are lovely people who think that this is the right thing to be doing to protesting Israel. They think that they're doing something morally good. You can talk to them. You can have you can actually talk and have a conversation with those students. They're not all angry and bitter and nasty. So, and there are Jews among them. I'm more concerned really with certain faculty who hate Israel and really hate Jews and who are egging the students on, want to be revolutionaries, and who are filled with anger. Those people worry me. And some of them already have tenure and we have to live with them until they retire decades. And what are they going to do to reshape the university? So that's my concern. How do I, how do I deal with those people? They're my colleagues. How do I talk to them? Thank you for that uh, input. So uh, Rabbi Spitz, I'm going to turn it over to you since we're um, right at the end of the program. I want to thank Professor Heschel for joining us today and sharing stories um, from your life and what you're working on now and the challenges you face and how you're also helping all of us because of the work you're doing. And I will share lots of follow-up, including I'll try to find some of the YouTube um, programs that you mentioned that are recorded so people can see the, the conversations that you convened. Anyway, for now, Rabbi Spitz, uh, over to you. So again, I too want to echo Ari's thanks to you, Susanna, Professor Heschel. You have one graced us with much to think about coming out of this conversation. And I begin and end where Ari began, namely, somehow I'm still drawn to your family Shabbos table. And much of the conversation has been, let's say, outside Shabbos. It's been the reality of uncertainty, pain, and um, tension. So What's a closing word that you would give us for our Shabbos table for this coming Friday night about the joy of being Jewish and why we should hold on to that as your gift to us? Well, you know, Shabbat is a moment in which we can feel ourselves and our lives in a different way. 
I remember as a child, we would light the Shabbat candles in the dining room and then go into the living room where we looked out the window and we saw the sun setting over the Hudson River in New York. And I remember telling my parents as a child that I felt even physically different after lighting the candles. I was almost puzzled. What's happened? And to be able to cultivate that, which I think, you know, also takes preparation. The preparation on Friday, the little bit of nervous tension of going to the store and buying the groceries and planning the meal and cooking again, everything ready. And then all of a sudden the time has come to turn off the stove and to go and light the Shabbat candles. And at the Shabbat table, you know, it's a mood Friday night. It's a mood that's different, let's say from Shabbat lunch or for Shalash Shuddha's Shabbat afternoon. Uh, it's a mood of joy, and I think also of happy memories. I think it's a time to talk about the past and what we remember of our parents, of our families, of our own childhoods, and tell each other stories about it, to bring our families, our parents and grandparents, if we knew them, to our Shabbat table, just like the angels come and visit us on Friday evening when we come home from Shul. I, I think it's um, it's a time to be happy and a time to remember. And my father never talked about political conflict at the Shabbat table because, you know, we're not allowed to light a fire on Shabbat. And that includes not lighting the fire of controversy, of anger. So it's a time where even what we talk about should be a time of happy memories that warm our hearts. And we also might talk about the Parsha of the week. We're coming now toward the end of, of the Torah. You know, I remember when I read the last part of the book of Deuteronomy, Devorah, about the death of Moses. And I cried when Moses died because Moses had always been such a big figure in my life growing up. So maybe that's something else we wanna to convey to our children. Something about Moses, something about the figures of the Bible who are also flawed in some ways, just like we are, but we're still inspiring figures. Give us some hope, which we need very much and some strength and some peace, some joy on Shabbat. Shabbat is a gift from God, and it's one of the greatest gifts that human beings have ever received. And it's up to us as Jews to preserve that gift because the world needs it desperately. And they're looking to us. So it was great to be with you. I'm sorry that I'm not with you in California, but Thank I hope you, you have a good well, summer. I'm going to bring your smile and your warmth to my Shabbos table next week and to your harvest of we should not despair and we should give ourselves the space to feel the gifts that are part of our lives, not only on Shabbat, but in each day. Thank you. You're a gift to each of us. Thank you so much, Rabbi Spitz and Ari Katz. Great to be with you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Wishing you a happy, healthy uh, Sunday and a great uh, July 4th week. Take care. See you online soon. Thank you, Phyllis Gilmore, for joining us and being such a great patron of CSP. Bye, everybody. Yana, good to see you as well. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Spitz. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, Rosa. Nice to see you.